management. In the last five years, the situation has significantly become more unequal. Today, eight people in the world, eight people in the world, own more money than four billion people in the world. In fact, the richest are accumulating wealth at an alarming rate. Forbes magazine recently said, and I read, that the first trillionaire in the world is going to come in the next 10 years. Now, if you want to think about what is a trillionaire, if a person spends $1 million a day for 2,700 years, then only that man will be able to observe his fortune. Look at the way people are living today. The situation in our country is even more stark, even worse. The fact is, in 1991, we didn't have a single dollar billion. Today we have 94. While the bottom half of India holds less than 1.7% of wealth in India, the bottom 50% of the population holds less than 2% of Indian wealth. And if you want to look at the fact that the richest 1% of India holds 61% of Indian assets, and the richest 10% own 92% of Indian assets. That means 90% of people in India own 8% of Indian assets. The celebrated American philosopher and leader Noam Chomsky said that what's striking about India, other than the warm and the wonderful people, was the indifference the misery of the man. In India, we have the richest man in India who builds a house in Bombay for 5,000 crore rupees. And this is the same city in which 30% of the city lives in the world's biggest slum in Bharat. And more than 250,000 people every day sleep on the streets of the city. In fact, if you look at the three richest people in India without taking names, they have outdone the GDP of 18 states in India. The three people. Now, if you contrast these figures with average rural income, the average family in India in rural India earns 5,240 rupees. This is for five people in one country. Why must we care about anybody? It's not just a moral standpoint, it's not just an ideological standpoint. We must care about inequality because inequality reflect, reflects the economic future of the country. Everything who's done, anything such as economics will tell you the high levels of economic growth and high levels of inequality can never coexist in the country for more than 20 years at a time. In fact, if you look at this shocking election of Donald Trump, if you look at the shocking exit of Britain from the European Union, if you look at all these things happening, what, what is the narrative that you see? The narrative is very simple. The explore some leaders exploding anger and the disaffection of the working class, of the underclass, and it convinces them that these bogey men, that these false enemies, like immigrants, like people of a certain religion, like people of a certain religion were responsible for their problems, when in fact that's absolute nonsense and it's the economic inequality that has forced the poor to become poorer and poorer and poorer. In India, we continue to pride ourselves on GDP. But as Robert Kennedy said, GDP measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. 
When we look at GDP, we say, okay, we've got 7% GDP. But it doesn't take into account that in the human development index, which we features and we talk about how uh, people live, we are 140 out of 168 countries in the world today. It talks about health, it talks about standard living, it talks about the environment, it talks about water. GDP fails to count the enormous amount of unpaid work done by women in India. It fails to talk about the 287 million illiterate adults in this country. And it fails to talk about the fact that 5,000 babies die every day in India because of lack of health care. The fact is that as the growth rate has gone up, so many amount of poor people in India. So which means the GDP has failed to take into account any sort of equity. In agriculture, the most stark example is in the 1980s, agriculture wages grew at 5%. In the 90s, agriculture wages grew by 2.5%. And for the last 15 years, agriculture wages have actually grown in the negative range, not in the next year. What is the way forward? No policy can single handed be in poverty. But the creation of a robust system for social protection and welfare is what is important. Just last month in Garwa, in Shalkan, an 80-year-old woman went outside the police station and she said, can I have a blanket because I'm dying of cold? And they said no. And she waited for 24 hours outside the police station and finally, She's close to on the road. Ten years later, you may have heard a story that's written about everywhere. In Odisha, in Balasov district, a 45-year-old man left his father's dead body outside the district magistrate's house because he said, I have no money to conduct his last words. The Constitution of India declares all men to be society. However, when individuals do not have the basic necessities like a blanket or like the ability to do the last rites to their parents, then what dignity and equality are we really talking about? The fact is that the spending on GDP, on human development index, has been terrible for as long as I can remember. On education, we spend less than 3% of GDP. On healthcare, we spend about 1% of GDP. If you compare this with even the other countries in place, I'm not talking about Scandinavia and Japan, I'm talking about Brazil, South Africa. They have overspent us in healthcare and education by 5 to 10 times each. If we don't invest in our country's future, we're not going to have a future. I want to talk to you about universal basic income. Universal basic income is a cash transfer given to citizens unconditionally so that they have a minimum level of dignity and existence. Save up along with UNICEF has started an example in District Indore where they took 6,000 people in 10 villages and they gave them a basic level of money for nothing in return every month just to test out will it improve people's job at the end of the day. And it was not a lot, it was just 300 rupees per hour and 150 rupees per channel. And what did they find? They found that after one year, the percentage of houses with one bed had gone up from 30% to 70%. The percentage of mobile phone ownership had gone up from 9% to 58%. The percentage of scooters had gone up from 3% to 20%. But most important was the level of malnutrition which had collapsed. 
the consumption of pulses had gone up hundred times. The consumption of milk and vegetables had gone up five hundred times. Which means that this belief that if you give people something, they will drink it away, or if you give people something, they will feel responsibly squander it away. This is not true. We need to trust our people. We need to double down on investing on our people through our people. Most of our current social welfare schemes are completely deficient. Look at the EPSC. The EPSC is the largest in India, but providing one rupee of food costs four rupees of administration. And 800 million tons of food bread every year goes waste in our whole lives. How much is 800 million food grains? 800 million tons. If Santa is further than from where we are in the moon, that's how much food is going to waste every year in India. A basic income would not be a way to for the EPS.
money for work is enhanced because most people are born in the world in our country. The fact is we need to have in our country an inheritance tax because everybody in this country was born poor finds it about 100 times more difficult to break that cycle of poverty. And even if the son of a mega rich person is utterly useless, it takes him about six generations to come down to planet Earth in any case. The fact is last year, in a heartbreaking letter, a Dalit PhD scholar in Hyderabad called Hayko Dhanudaji who took his own life, expressed his helplessness for a being able to escape the fatal accident of his birth. And just hit me like a break with those words, the fatal accident of his birth. Articles 14 and 15 mandate quality in our country. But the fact is that so many years after independence, Questions forming about the most unique things. Today, let's not take it for granted. This country is not just a geographical mass of people. This country lives within us, irrespective of how we look, who we pray to, what our belief system is. Let's try to build the India of our dreams. Let's involve ourselves as agents of change. Let's believe that not that we should build a better India, but we have to build a better India. Because that is the India that is going to be your legacy and my legacy for future generations. Together, we have to dream big and we have to fight together to achieve your dreams and mine. Thank you for coming here.